So um, this presentation is based on Oxfam's Grow campaign. Oxfam started the Grow campaign about four years ago, and it's a campaign that is looking at the um, underlying causes of poverty. We've, we've heard some of the, um, the big issues uh, surrounding poverty in Australia and some of those systemic causes of poverty and inequality globally. And that's where the Grow campaign picks up um, those sort of sentiments and looks at it from a global perspective as to what is causing food insecurity globally. Why do we have 805 million people hungry in this world? And uh, some of the root causes that Oxfam looks at, campaigns on, and works in country directly on programs on our climate change. It's a big um, focus for Oxfam at the moment in terms of creating more food insecure people. Uh, land grabs, so people being um, kicked off their land for whether it be crops for biofuels or food commodities. A lot of people losing their land, losing their livelihoods and their um, ability to sustain themselves and their families as a result of land grabs. And um, small scale food producers, there's, um, there's actually a very strange paradox in the global food system and that is that of the 805 million people hungry, 80% of them are small scale farmers. So one way or another, 80% of the hungry globally have some way of creating food, are, are participating in the food production system. And it's a little bit like the stat that I think Bridget brought up in terms of people are actually earning, but they're not earning enough to feed their families. People are growing, they're not growing enough to feed their families. So that starts to point to some of the, um, the solutions and what we need to do to support those, those um, farming communities, those small scale food producers in, in um, in, the, in supporting them and ensuring that these bigger threats like land grabs and climate change don't further undermine them. Okay, so, oh, wrong one. Aha, there we go. What my bio didn't tell you um, is that I really like growing food and this is my so most successful crop um, in terms of I really, really suggest that you go out and, and plant purple king beans. They are so easy to grow and each plant can yield about 1.2 kilos worth of beans. I haven't quite um, got to that level yet, but um, I'm pretty, pretty close. So anyway, big plug for purple king beans today. Um, I was thinking about this um, presentation and I thought, actually I come from a political and government background, but I want to talk about our work with corporations and I want to talk about our work at that personal level today. And I thought, well, how can I kind of bring those two elements together? And in that very day, so I just, I'm just going to wait. Yes, that very day, this came up in my Instagram feed. And um, Jane Goodall, who you would know, um, said this. She said, when millions, billions of people make ethical choices, we shall see massive change. When a big corporation starts to think this way, change can come even more quickly. And I was, I was quite amazed because those are actually the two um, key tenets of my presentation, the key issues I wanted to talk to you about um, in terms of Oxfam's work in, in those two domains. We do a lot of political work, but I'll focus on those two t domains today. This is a campaign I'm not sure if you've um, heard about, but it's the Behind the Brands campaign. It's looking at the top 10 big food companies and the impact that they have on people who are food insecure, on people who are hungry, but on the, on the broader food system. So obviously the top 10 food companies produce a lot of food, they feed a lot of people. But inadvertently, or more directly, they are actually making people hungry at the same time. So Oxfam did a report uh, called Behind the, Brand, Behind the Brands and assessed the top 10 food companies that um, I'll talk to you about some of those in a minute and uh, looked at them across seven criteria and uh, these criteria were then assessed as to whether or not they disclose their policies. They're actually addressing some fundamental issues relating to workers' rights, women, climate change, water, transparency in their reporting, etc and um, rated them, and it's, it's a tool to try and get some change within the, um, the big food company system, but it's also um, trying to kind of get them to race to the top. So a little bit of um, competition between some of the big players in the, in the food industry. And some of the um, results of that research are shown here. Um, Coke got a 54% uh, rating, which 
Um, basically, they, they pretty much all failed this test, but um, Coke did better than some in that um, it's uh, actually recently made some big improvements in the area of land. So as a result of Oxfam's campaign, it's declared a zero tolerance for land grabbing, which means that the suppliers of sugar in particular to Coke have to do things like um, show that they have, have adhered to free, free prior and informed consent for landholders. So people can't just be kicked off their land because a cash crop's coming in that's then going to um, sell to Coke. Coke is now uh, being held accountable by Oxfam to ensure that that doesn't happen as a result of its sugar suppliers' um, actions. And Coke is, has signed up to quite rigorous principles, including uh, some independent um, audits of its, of its um, activities and its subsidiary to activities. So um, that's a good news story from Coke, but obviously it's got a little bit of work to do, especially in the area of farmers, um, which it only got a, a two out of ten for. Uh, and, um, and some work to do in reporting, that's for sure, with only a 5 out of 10 for transparency. Kellogg's um, scored 29%. They didn't do too well on pretty much any of the um, categories. Uh, but in August this year, they've agreed to take some actions with regards to climate change. So they've said yes, they will start to uh, count their emissions set targets and put in place some measures to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions across their supply chain um, and their own internal activities. So again, as a result of public campaigning and advocacy, it was wonderful to hear Bill talk um, about the um, importance of advocacy and the power of advocacy. These results, as small steps in the, in the path they are, are as a result of advocacy from people all around the world. Okay, I'll have to move a little bit faster, but um, General Mills, they own Old El Paso and uh, Latina Fresh Pasta, and they, they got a 21% rating across those categories. July this year, they've also um, agreed to set uh, climate change emissions targets and put in place measures to adhere to those targets. And then um, a brand we'll all be very familiar with, Twinings, who's, old, who's owned by uh, Associated British Foods. They have now created some new policies around the, the land area as well, ensuring that people have free prior and informed consent before they are removed from their land to make way for whether it be sugar or tea or any other product that Associated British Foods um, makes. And that's a, that was a really big win because they were certainly holding out and um, they were dragging the chain there for a while, but they did come to the party in the end. Uh, there's lots of, lots of public campaigning, lobbying, advocacy work that was done to achieve that. I promised in this talk that I'd mentioned some of the more creative um, mechanisms that we use in our programming, our public engagement programming, and one of them is a program called Design for Change, and that's a program where we go into universities and design schools and colleges, and we um, invite students to take up a brief. Um, in fact, when we say invite, we ask them to via their lecturer. They're forced to do it, but <laughs> they take up the Oxfam brief and they have to design communication products and campaigns and, and um, anything creative, really, to get Oxfam's messages and calls to action uh, out there in the community in a way that's much more, um, I guess, target audience oriented, so youth friendly or popular culture oriented and, and just really um, is, is a bit more dynamic and, and um, creative. So Design for Change um, set the challenge of the Behind the Brands campaign and some of the students came up with things like this poster series around um, Kellogg's products, you know, Snap, Crackle and Poor Business Practice and, you know, just like a chocolate milkshake, only unethical and things like that. So they really use their creative um, juices to sort of try and tackle these, these issues. Uh, another example is a food waste challenge that we did with the support of Love Food Hate Waste. They actually uh, provided us with the funding to create this online platform and it's um, able to be used uh, um, across a number of food related uh, domains and issues. And this student put together a, a, a print campaign called Bubble and Squeak. Another student uh, created a, a concept for a, food, a, um, a film festival 
And so this one was called Why Waste Film Festival and um, they organised everything from the, um, the Instagram kind of concepts that they would use through to the venue and the poster series and all the promotions. So this is just one little um, focused on youth initiative that we have to uh, en engage a not so likely uh, part of the community, so young design students in some of those big, heavier, kind of more political issues that we talk about on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's been very um, successful to date. So onto the personal is political kind of uh, platform. We put together a series of six good food principles, so sustainable, fair food principles, which cumulatively do make a difference. So we've got some really great data backing it up, showing um, that if, if people in um, all around the world or in a number of countries were to take this action, then this would be the result, and I'll show you some of those results. Uh, so it's, they're principles that you're going to be very familiar with and that I'm sure a lot of people at this conference um, put, put in place in their day-to-day -day life and are very um, passionate about, because it really does make these big issues quite tangible and personal and also um, hits a whole lot of uh, buttons in terms of being healthy, being local, being sustainable, being seasonal, all those kind of concepts. So this is the, um, you know, grow at home kind of concept, six, ste six steps to make good things grow in our homes and to make the global food system more sustainable and fair for everybody. So first of all is the, the save food concept. Um, and so we have partnered up with um, Foodwise and Second Bite and Oz Harvest um, to support what they do and also to promote that concept of reducing food waste in our own homes. You know the stat about $8 billion worth of food being wasted. This also has implications on family incomes because Foodwise shows that, um, and Love Food Hate Waste for that matter, shows that over $1,000 worth of food is wasted um, in an average family, so it does actually hit the, you know, the, the, the bottom line, the pocket as well. In terms of fair trade, that's something that Oxfam is very well known for. It's a fundamental principle of what we do and growing food internationally with fair trade principles and practices is going to reduce hunger worldwide. Uh, a lot of people, as I mentioned before, are growing food, they are working in factories, they are working on the, in the fields for these big food companies, uh, and yet they're not able to feed their own families. So uh, buying fair trade is, wherever possible, is an absolute essential element of a, of a more f fair and equitable food system. And obviously buying it is a, is a vote for that kind of system. And I just thought, well, a lot of people say to me, but isn't it more expensive? Um, but I did kind of have a look at that. And um, at the Oxfam shop, for instance, this is just a very small example, but it, it, it is replicated in, on, across a number of products. At the Oxfam shop, you can buy um, black tea for $4.50, the equivalent product, same number of tea bags, same number of grams, with twinings is $7.50 from Woolworths. So I think that in terms of fair trade being a more expensive product, because we see it in chocolate and exclusive chocolates, etc., in Maloney's, etc., um, there's that feeling that it's more expensive because you're paying a higher wage to those people overseas, and I'm not sure if I can afford that but there's a perfect example of where it's actually cheaper than your, your standard product. Um, the next principle is around seasonality and local um, food and reducing um, food miles, etc. This is an area where there isn't really great data and research to, um, to support um, all the environmental claims, I think, that are, that are made around seasonal produce, but we know from, uh, I guess, from the other aims that this conference is exploring and, and furthering, that supporting food producers in our own area, in our own communities, is a good thing and does, does support a, a better quality of life for ourselves and, and those farmers in the Sydney Basin or Murray-Darling Basin. So we're um, big supporters of seasonal, um, seasonal and local foods and also um, indigenous varieties and increasing uh, that, that diversity in the food system 
That's very relevant for our South American colleagues, for instance, who have been trying to um, fight off big companies such as Monsanto and others and trying to get that diversity and that, um, that uh, power back in their food system and the seeds in which they, they use and want to, to develop and grow. The next um, principle, number four, is about reducing energy consumption in the home and in the kitchen. This might have um, you know, a smaller impact, but again, cumulatively, if you only boil the amount of water that you need to use, if you only, um, uh, you know, if, if you use kind of the foods in the appropriate way and you, and you reduce energy wherever you can in the kitchen, it all adds up and it does actually um, affect the hip pockets. So that can be of assistance too. Um, the fifth principle is around eating sustainably. We've got 75% of the world's oceans already ex overexploited, and so uh, I think there's some great work that being done in, across community organisations promoting the types of fish and the types of seafood products that we can uh, still consume but not uh, completely decimate the oceans. So by keeping these principles in mind, sometimes again they're cheaper options because they're less so-called you know, mainstream or attractive fish, they're smaller fish, they're a bit further down the food chain. So these kind of um, decisions again are, are still quite fringe, they're not really mainstreamed yet, but they, they do need to be part of a broader understanding of what a, a safe and fair and uh, environmentally sustainable food system looks like. So now I'll just touch on the sixth principle, which is not about eating more elephants, <laughs> it's about the elephant in the room, which um, is one of the more controversial principles and, um, and does fire up some lively debate whenever it's brought up. And that is around um, consuming less meat and less dairy products. Now the reason that Oxfam and um, our partners and, and organisations will be behind this concept is because globally 70% of arable land is used to grow either foodstuffs to feed animals or to graze animals themselves. 70% of arable land. And um, interestingly, the meat and, life, uh, meat and dairy industry has a bigger footprint in terms of climate emissions than that of global transport. That's all your trains and cars and planes together. And that stat has just been updated last year by the Food and Agriculture Organisation. A um, couple of minutes left. Now, Australians are the third largest meat eaters in the world. Uh, so this is quite a um, relevant issue for Australians. And um, just again from that financial perspective, there's an interesting study that was done by LearnVest. So this is a, a, a financial advice and, um, and financial assessment organisation. It has nothing to do with food or eating animals. Um, they compared a few different diets and found that a vegetarian or vegan diet could reduce your um, food costs by around about um, $1,200 a year just by converting to a more plant-based diet. So I think again there are financial savings there and then you all know about the fact that um, eating a more plant-based diet reduces um, cardiac disease etc. Another great piece of research came out last year, um, the largest of its, of its kind and showed that 32% uh, decrease in um, in heart disease as a result of vegetarian diet. There was 45,000 people involved in that study. So there's lots of you know, boxes that get ticked with that, that particular principle of eating less meat and, and dairy products. Now I don't have time to talk to you about our work with celebrities and, um, and the fact that from a behaviour change perspective it's so important to have these relevant and I guess um, credible voices promoting good food principles, healthy, nutritious, fair and sustainable food principles. But these are the ones that we've got together mo most recently with our Eat Local Feed Global campaign. And, um, and they're all big champions of, of one or more of these principles that I mentioned. Now I'll just um, finish up with uh, showing you the Three Things logo. It's uh, fresh off the press. This is our youth program 
and uh, it's designed specifically to reach out to universities and school uh, children and uh, in involve them in social justice campaigning and advocacy in a way that's meaningful to them and relevant to them. And so with three things, we ask people, young people, what are the three things you can do to change the world? And then they come up with their own personal three things, um, pop them on the website, write them on a chalkboard, have a photo with them, that sort of thing. So these are the three things that I came up with that I just wanted to um, reiterate from my chat. Again, we know that there's a lot of people hungry in the world, 805 million people, and more to the point, we all can do something about that, whether it be through our food choices on a personal level or through our advocacy in terms of telling big food companies what we expect them to do and that we don't want them to be making people hungry at the same time as feeding us. I guess my second point is that a healthy diet um, can also lead to a healthier planet from that sustainability perspective and looking at all of the impacts that the agricultural system has on, environmentally, uh, on, on environmental sustainability and therefore the social consequences that that has. And then finally, sustainable diets can actually save money. There were a few examples I gave there of fair trade, reducing meat consumption, reducing food waste, and um, I will wrap up there. Thank you very much, everyone.